the Back to the Future soundtrack greets us uh, on day two of Rustfest Zurich. Today we are starting with a keynote by Alex Crichton, followed by some announcements of workshops and the workshops themselves. Okay, so I prepared all night for this introduction. And I met Alex in, I think it was May 2016, when he was traveling Europe yep. and stopped by in Cologne. And we sat down one evening and over some courage discussed some parts of his visions for Rust's future. And if I remember correctly, so we had, a lot, we had a lot of drinks, so I'm not sure it was actually what we talked about, but I imagine it was something like his grand secret vision of like taking over the Rust project and speeding up the coming AI singularity. But I don't think that's the kind of futures he is going to talk about now. Anyway, so it's, it's movie-related movie what he is uh, going to talk about. So, of course, I have to ask him, what is the best indie time travel movie? <laughs> and why is it Primer? <laughs> <laughs> Alex Crichton, everyone. Thank you, Pasco. And actually, it was Primer, and he had that question before we said that. Anyway, all right, so today I would like to talk to you about Tokyo and how we hit 88 miles per hour. Now, I heard some questions that not everyone understands this, so I decided to make it a little more European-friendly. <laughs> Or, sorry, I should say non-American friendly. But in any case, my name is Alex. I'm a member of the core team. I've been working on Rust for about uh, four years out of Mozilla now. And uh, today I'd like to talk, talk to you about Tokyo, an asynchronous I.O. framework. And when I say 88 miles per hour, what I'm actually referring to is this movie called Back to the Future. Now, this is an iconic classic of American cinema, Back to the Future, where the defining feature of this movie is this magic, uh, scientific DeLorean <laughs> powered by the flux capacitor, where when it reaches 88 miles per hour, you'll see sparks fly, and it travels forwards and backwards in time, and it's, it's an amazing movie. Everyone should go watch it. I'll be hosting it after. No, I don't, I don't actually have it. <laughs> So uh, when, I talk about, uh, when I talk about Back to the Future, I'm, I'm using this movie because it has the word future in it, but also it implies this insane level of speed. And so when I talk about this, uh, what I mean is that Tokyo itself is an insanely fast asynchronous I.O. framework. So this is kind of the canonical chart that we like to show, which actually introduced Tokyo and futures to the Rust uh, community, where on, this far left, or on the far left you have this very tall graph, which is the Rust thing, showing that we have this insanely high request per second, even compared to a bunch of other frameworks. And so... Most people tend to have a reaction that looks like this. Uh, <laughs> Marty McFly and Doc... I, I'm gonna, I, I will tone back the Back to the Future references eventually, but not yet. So, to uh, explain this, we typically say that Rust has zero-cost futures. That's kind of the foundation by which all of this is built, this zero-cost future aspect. But while you're hearing about this, you're like, wait, okay, hang on, I'd like you to explain that a little bit more. And before you say that, we're going to say, oh, but Mio is low level. You have this Mio library. It's great. It does all this asynchronous I.O. And you're like, great. What's Mio? Oh, we also have traits. It's a future of a trait. You can do whatever you want. We have this Tokyo framework with layers and all these possible entry points for you. And we have lightweight tasks that are kind of like green threading. And it ends up feeling a little bit like this when we're just kind of <laughs> shouting all this at you. And if you don't recognize this, I would highly recommend you watch the talks from uh, RustConf in 2016. It was excellent. But, so today, I want to give you the equivalent of a sports almanac. And you might be thinking, that's, that's insane, what are you talking about here? But, Back to the Future 2, that's right, there's actually three movies, but in the second movie, the plot of this movie was that the evil Biff, Biff just sounds evil, the evil Biff takes a sports almanac back in time to, I think, his dad at that time, and, gave, and gives this to him. And then using the sports almanac, he's able to correctly predict every single horse race or every single race or sports event and basically get super rich from gambling and all that. So I'm not actually going to talk much about sports here, but I'd like to give you the Tokyo almanac instead, only valid until 2018. But so I would like to give you a bit of an idea today about kind of the internals of Tokyo and kind of the internals of futures and give you a better idea about what I actually mean by zero cost, how we actually achieve these insane levels of speed that we see on futures and that we see in Tokyo. So to start off, I'd like to give you a bit of an idea about uh, what I mean by AsyncIO and kind of give you a bit of an introduction to Tokyo itself in case you're not super familiar with it, which I'm, sh I'm sure there's a few of you at least. So to start off, 
asynchronous I.O. is typically contrasted with what is uh, typically the first thing you're reaching for in programming, which is synchronous I.O. So in synchronous I.O., what you'll typically do is you'll have a TCP socket, and you'll say, I want to read some data off of this into this buffer. And then after some amount of time, the kernel will come back and say, all right, you got four bytes. And the key thing here is that your, uh, the calling context, this current thread, is blocked. It can do nothing else until this call returns. So it can do nothing useful while you're waiting for a TCP read or come, bytes to come in. And that can take a very long time sometimes. You could have some connections running at megabytes per second, other connections run, running at megabits or kilobytes per second. It's, it's kind of very variable there. So the defining aspect of async I.O. is that the kernel immediately says, nope, this is going to block. So all of these operations, like when you try and read it into a buffer, the kernel will immediately tell you, I do not have bytes. You're going to have to figure out when to call me again later. So specifically what's happening here is that every single I.O. operation in the asynchronous I.O. world never blocks. Everything immediately returns and just immediately takes no time at all. And then later, you will receive a batch set of notifications saying these objects are ready for reading, these objects are ready for writing, kind of various events coming out of the kernel. And so you are then responsible for actually dispatching these events. You have to then say, all right, well, I'm, I'm interpreting these, these giant lists from the kernel, and I'm going to figure out where all that goes. But what that ends up looking like is actually a very difficult world to work with. So typically, you're a pretty reasonable person. You just want to grab the, the, the contents of the Rustling homepage, and you just want to render that, your browser, your server, your whatever. But as a result to this question or a result to this request, the only thing we can do is, oh, File Descriptor 5 is ready. And that's not actually very helpful. You can't, okay, well, I don't really know what File Descriptor 5 is connected to. I, I, where's the TLS in there? So kind of this ends up being a very difficult system to work with. This kind of asynchronous I.O. world is very unwieldy. It's not composable, and it's very difficult to get right. And so to solve this problem, this is where futures come into play. So futures are a sentinel for a value which will then become available at a later point in time. And more concretely, what's happening here is that a future is a proxy for an object, which will kind of like, you eventually can pull it out, but it's not immediately ready. But it's kind of the embodiment of object, or object orientation in the asynchronous I.O. world, where you have this one object which encapsulates all of its internal state, and it's kind of all an opaque box. All you know is that you can pull out a particular type from it, and it's just happening asynchronously in the background. And the other key thing about features, kind of like with object-oriented programming, is that you can actually start composing these together. So you can say, once this feature has completed, I can now run this feature, or I can change a feature of a string to a feature of an integer by just parsing it, and kind of all these other various operations you can do internally just by kind of creating and mapping and dealing with all of these features that are themselves objects. So an example of this is this previous example we had of kind of grabbing the contents of the rustling homepage. When now when you ask this question, instead of saying file descriptor 5 is ready, you'll get this response saying, oh, all right, here is a future of a vector of bytes. And this internally encapsulates everything necessary to actually deal with this. So for example, this is going to make a TCP connection. Well, it's, first it's going to resolve rustling.org. It's going to make a TCP connection to one of those sites. It's going to negotiate TLS. It's going to parse the HTTP protocol. It's going to deal with the request response. All of that is encapsulated in just this one future, and you don't have to worry about any of the internal states. So kind of all of that is built for you, and you, you, you don't, you, there's, much, there's far fewer kind of correctness worries. It's much easier to get futures programming correct than it is to deal with just juggling file descriptors around, all around the place. And to give you another example of uh, what I mean by futures and some examples of what you can do with it, this is a small example where we're going to spawn off some work. So we'll say here we're going to, on some thread pool, spawn the 100 Fibonacci number, some asynchronous computation. And the key thing here is this function will immediately return. And this local variable result is going to be a proxy for the actual value of the 100 Fibonacci number. So in the meantime, we can do whatever. We can grab some coffee. We can try and wake up because it's a little early in the morning. We can then come down and say, all right, Eventually, I actually need the value of this feature, so you can wait on it, you can wait for it to be resolved, and then I'll perform some synchronization with the actual thread pool itself, and then eventually, this result down here at the bottom will actually be the hun hundredth Fibonacci number, and you have this resolved value of the future. And so the key thing here is that this is asynchronous. Whenever you have a future, the, the computation, the result of that computation is somehow being computed in the background in a kind of quote-unquote sense, and you can do other work in the meantime as a result. Now, so moving up to Tokyo, I like to say that Tokyo is the fusion of the Mio library and futures. Now, you don't have to worry so much about what actually Mio particularly is, but it suffices to say that it's cross-platform async I.O. 
And so dealing with async I.O. is actually entirely different on Linux and OS X and Windows, and dealing with all, all of these details all the time is very, very difficult. So what Mio is doing is basically just giving you a cross-platform uniform interface to asynchronous I.O. On the, on the actual system. So when anyone says Mio, all they really mean is that non-blocking I.O. of things return immediately, and then there's some way later to get a batch set of notifications saying this is everything that just happened. And then features, on the other hand, with Tokyo basically just mean that you can build up these features with I.O. objects internally. So you can say, I, I can build up TCP sockets, and I can have, so, so that can be part of the logic of how to resolve my future. So Tokyo uh, is ba essentially features powered by I.O. This is TCP, UDP, Unix sockets, name pipes, all that good stuff. Uh, Tokyo, because it is built on top of Miu, ends up working across all major pla platforms. And then finally, if, you've, if you're familiar with asynchronous I.O. in general, Tokyo is kind of your event loop. Tokyo is the one that's actually dispatching these events. Tokyo is the one that is responsible for waking up these features, and we'll get into all of that a, a little bit more in de detail later. And I also think Tokyo is kind of a cool name and a fun city to visit. I would highly recommend everyone visit Tokyo. It's a lot of fun. But to give you a bit of an idea of where features, is, where features are today, so in the features crate, we have a trait for a feature, which is one value coming out at a particular time. We also have a stream trait for many, many values coming over time. You can think of this as an uh, asynchronous iterator, just items with lo very long pauses between them. We also have a sync where streams are kind of given, items are given to you, whereas with a sync you push items in there. And then we also have a bunch of uh, in-memory, we have a, kind of a, a very large toolkit around dealing with features today. So we have one-shot channels for in-memory computations like that Fibonacci number we saw earlier. We have MPSC streams, very similar to the standard library of just in-memory, thread-safe channels uh, of dealing with uh, items over time. And then finally, you'll find a lot of integration with modern crates such as Rayon, where you can actually just spawn some work into a Rayon thread pool and get a feature out of that. And then whenever you block on that feature, it'll kind of do the right thing of doing the Rayon work stealing using all your cores. It ends up just being super fast. But so the other thing I wanted to talk about with features today is we actually do have async await syntax. And some of you who are familiar with JavaScript or C Sharp or Python working in the asynchronous worlds there, you'll remember that, or you'll probably know that this kind of syntax is critical for, write, for writing large applications. And so this is only available in the nightly channel today. It's very, so pretty recent at this point. But some of the highlights are that you can activate this by having this async attribute, which says that this function is uh, actually going to return a future. So despite saying the return value is, is a result, this is actually going to construct some feature and then return it whenever you invoke it. You can then use the await macro to say I like to actually block on this value of the future. So this is a hyper asynchronous client which gives you a feature or result, but this won't actually block the thread. It's just going to block the feature. So this is still an asynchronous computation and it's able to just kind of write code in a very synchronous looking style while end up just building an, a giant asynchronous feature. If you've worked with combinators in Rust, if you kind of worked the futures before, you'll notice that early returns are insanely hard, and they're very easy to do with async and await. So this is kind of a great feature of having early returns of either OKs or errors, and again, just kind of adds to the very synchronous feeling of code, kind of what you would expect from normal Rust as you write it today. And then finally, we also have asynchronous for loops, where we have this stream trait to kind of values coming out over time. So this is saying that the, the actual body of this HTTP request is taking a long time to come to us, so we'll kind of process each chunk and then this is all just building up one giant feature externally to work with. So uh, I also want to talk a little bit about where Tokyo is today. Tokyo is currently split up into a few crates. I won't go into too much detail about these, but we have Tokyo Core, uh, some higher level proto and service. But if you're interested in kind of the details here, I'd highly recommend you start with the current RFC and kind of reorganizing some of these crates. I actually think it's number three now that we had to close that by accident. But uh, suffice to say that in any case, today we, uh, Tokyo has a very large amount of integrations with other objects in the community. So you'll have, in addition to the networking types of TCP and UDP, you'll have Unix sockets, name pipes, signals, uh, protocols such as HTTP2 coming soon. We've seen more and more protocols, more and more IO primitives getting bound in Tokyo every day. So you end up having a very large suite of objects to choose from, kind of what you would expect out of, out of an event loop library. And also we've seen Tokyo deployed with great success to a lot of companies so far, and we're super excited to see where everyone takes it from, uh, fr from there. So all right, that's a little bit about um, Tokyo and futures. So I w it's a bit of an introduction. So now, now that we're kind of on the same page, I want to dive a little bit more into why the future trait is so fast. And so we're going to get to this concept of tasks. I haven't actually mentioned that later. But uh, specifically, let's start out by writing a future. Let's define a future. Let's start from, let's start from scratch. 
So the first thing that we might do is write down a struct. So we'll say we'll have a struct of a feature with some type that it can resolve to because it's generic, and then we'll have some sort of implementation for this. But right off the bat, there's already a first problem. The fact that this is a struct, this means that there is one implementation of a feature that we're going to be giving you, but that actually might not always be correct. That could be a thread safe feature, and you may not want to pay for that level of thread safety. It could be a non-thread safe feature, and you want that level of thread safety. So this ends up being very inflexible, where you, by having only one definition, we can't necessarily cater to everyone's needs. But it turns out Rust does have a feature for this called traits. So traits allow you to have the most specialized implementation for a feature that you possibly need. So your case of if you need thread safe, you can use a thread safe feature. If you don't need thread safe, you can use a non-thread safe feature. And they, kind of, they can still interoperate together because they're still implementing the same fundamental trait. In this case, we have an associated item of, of what, what's actually coming out. But now the problem is we have to actually fill this in. We need to have some sort of implementation here. And so as I was saying earlier, a feature is a sentinel for a value which is going to become available at some point in time. And so when we think about this, uh, it's kind of a future is an asynchronous computation. Eventually it's going to be run. Eventually it's going to be completed. So why not let's have some sort of callback. Let's say that when this feature is resolved, when this feature finishes completing itself, it's going to invoke this callback with the actual value. And that way you can then do further processing and you can hook into how this feature is being completed. And it turns out in most systems that implement features today, this is actually how it's implemented. You have some sort of callback based system where when the features are done, you run a callback and then that might go in further and schedule some more callbacks. So I want to dive into a lot of details here about, we, we actually went down this road quite a long ways before we ended up where we currently are today. And so the first thing you'll notice is this bracket F and this bare self. And so this crucially means that this trait cannot be compatible with virtual dispatch. It is not what we call object safe. It can't be turned into a trait object. And it doesn't so matter, matter so much about the details of why, but it suffices to say that you can't erase the type, you can't have virtual dispatch, you can only kind of uh, have one at a time. And I'm going to give you an example of why that's actually a problem. So let's say you're just writing a function which is going to take a key, it's going to have some sort of cache to immediately, uh, to immediately return values and otherwise have some sort of slow computation. So we'll notice here that we'll look up in the cache, if it's ready to go, we'll return a feature saying, oh, this is done, and then if it's not done, we'll go do the actual slow computation that'll fill in the cache and all that good stuff. So the first thing we'll notice is that this actually doesn't compile. This is, these are two branches of an if statement where Rust will require that these are the exact same type and these are two different types, an immediately resolved feature and then a delayed feature that'll take a little bit longer to actually process later on. So if we try and solve this, there's actually a relatively easy local solution where we can just pack this in an either enum, or we can say that the left-hand side is returning the A, the A variant, the right-hand side is returning the B variant, and then this just assumes that both, if you have an either of A, B, that implements future if either one of those is a future and then just kind of does that. And this works great enough for two cases, but then it starts being a problem once you get even more cases. So what if we have more conditions where if it's less than four, you do one thing, and it's greater than five, you do another thing. And we might get this problem where what happens when we have 27 cases, AA, little a, I'm actually not sure what the conventions are there. But so it suffices to say that this isn't gonna cut it. We can't have just an enum. We can't statically say that this is the number of branches that we're going to be taking. What we really need here is type erasure. We need to return these trade objects so this box of future, these creating these boxes of what's actually being returned. So this is a critical feature of, of features and traits, which is that at some point you have to be able to erase the type, and you have to be able to say that I don't know what, where this feature came from, but it's still a feature. You can still use it as a feature. So having this ability for, 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 for virtual dispatch ends up being a crucial feature that we're going to need out of the features trait. So we come back here to our definition and we'll take a look at this bracket alpha and this self and we'll say, all right, so these are not compatible with features. These are not gonna work out. I'm not gonna go into details as to why this is its own talk in and of itself, but this is an alternate signature which actually is object safe. Or we have this and mute self and this box of fn once. Now, this, is, um, this isn't, I'll, I'll gloss over a few details here, but the, suffice to say that the, the drawback of this approach is that this closure is allocated on the heap. So this could actually be a relatively expensive operation, and I want to explore that specifically and kind of why that is such an expensive operation. So uh, to, to explain that, here I want to talk about kind of how we envision servers to be written nowadays with Tokyo and kind of with features, kind of what the uh, style for that would be. And this is very heavily inspired by Finagle and Scala, if you're familiar with that, where the fundamental idea is that your entire server is a function from a request to a feature of a response 
which means that everything you've written in your server is entirely asynchronous. It's all entirely built up in this one feature, and it's just all encapsulated in that one thing, and then the, the framework is what takes this and then starts processing that and dealing with decoding it and, and whatnot. And so you might have a server which, for example, it receives a request, loads some information from a database, does some remote API calls, done some more database whatnot, and finally renders a response. And internally, we can notice that these are actually all creating features in the middle. So loading some rows from a database might actually take some time. Doing an API call might take, might take some time. And so we're going to encapsulate all these with features, and then we're going to use those to build up a final feature. So if we kind of look at this a little bit graphically, we have all these states that we're going to go through. The first state is we have a request, and then we're waiting on a database query, then we're waiting on an API query, so on and so forth. And what's actually happening here is we're going to box all this up. We're going to put this all into one giant feature, and this is what we're going to return from our server. So our server is then responsible for returning this one feature with all of the state encapsulated internally for how you're actually processing this. And then so with our trait, we have our schedule function saying when this feature is done, I'd like you to run this callback. So to, pr to actually progress between these states, we're going to have these calls to schedule. We're going to say, when this loading of the database is done, I'd like you to schedule a callback, which then fires off some more computations and then runs and actually goes and fetches the API queries. And then when that's done, I'd like you to uh, schedule another callback to start loading some other database rows, so on and so forth. And the critical thing we're noticing here is that every single state transition this future is making is actually a call to schedule. That's how we're progressing between these states. We're saying that every time we, we make a state transition here, we're scheduling a callback, saying when that feature is done, we'd like to now run another feature. And when we start scaling this up, we notice that um, server, the, because the server, is in, the server response is entirely a feature, that feature is, tends to be composed of many other features, as we just saw. And then they themselves, as we saw originally, fetching an API request, fetching something from github.com, that's actually going to take a lot of TLS negotiation, a lot of internals there. So that internally is made up of many, many other features. So we have this massive tree of features, which is, goes far beyond what we actually wrote down, because everything is internally made of features. And as a result, over this entire request, we have many, many, many state transitions. This, this, this concept of state transition is almost happening every time bytes come in off the network, which could be very, very frequent, very, very, very rapid. And the critical thing here is that if every single state transition actually allocates a callback, it's incredibly expensive. Now, for this kind of one general, if we only allocated five callbacks, that would be fine. But what we wanted to do is we want to push the boundaries of features. We want to make sure that you can use features everywhere up and down the stack with kind of a uniform interface. And that requires us to get this cost down even further, and this allocation of callbacks is just not going to cut it for us. But it's not just cost. It's not just runtime cost. It's also the actual API cost of having a callback. So we'll notice here that we have this box of fn once, but we didn't say anything about thread safety. So Rust has this trait called send, which says that this value can be sent across other threads. It has sync saying that you can actually invoke this closure across many threads concurrently. And we didn't say anything about that. So this strict definition says that you can actually only run completion callbacks on the thread you initially had it on. Now that's not actually compatible if you have two threads computing a value and you kind of want to fire one from one to the other. But then the problem is that if we put in a send bound here and we, require, and we enable that use case, we're then, having, we're then costing the other use case of I don't need the thread safe features and I need the, the extra speed from not having this level of synchronization. So the problem here is we're faced with an uncomfortable and impossible question of what do we actually do? What, how do we actually assign this callback? So the drawbacks are not just that this is incredibly expensive, because it, it, it ends up being very expensive the farther that you push features, but this thread safety aspect is really going to require some gymnastics if we're going to try and solve it. This is either going to require synchronization where it's not necessary, or it's going to preclude synchronization to even exist where it actually needs to be, needs to be necessary. And then we actually experimented with a couple of uh, variants of thread safe and non thread safe feature traits where you have kind of this parallel hierarchy, but it ends up being very, very difficult to use and essentially impossible to, to make sense of. So it suffices to say that callbacks are not going to cut it for us. This ends up, we've, at this point, we're not going to be able to use callbacks. This traditional way of implementing features is not going to work. So let's recap some of the constraints that we've seen so far. Number one, we need to be a trait. We have to allow these very specialized implementations. We can't assume that any one is going to be sufficient for everyone. This trait itself, though, has to also enable virtual dispatch. We can't compromise on that. There might be cases where we don't know what kind of feature we're going to be returning, and so we have to be able to erase that type and have some level of virtual dispatch there. State transitions are happening all over the place. 
We can't allocate all the time. We can't make sure these are very expensive. These, this, we need to optimize for as many state transitions to happen and have that be a very cheap operation. And then finally, we have to enable these thread safe cases. You have to, we can't force you to either be thread safe or not thread safe and everyone be in one world or the other. We have this fundamental divide where there are legitimate reasons to be in one world or the other and simultaneously use those in the same application and we need one interface to kind of work across everything. So to solve this, I'm gonna take a bit of a, a larger look at what this server design is looking like. So we had this diagram before of all these state transitions of our one request. We have our, our big feature, which internally is made up of little features. And so let's zoom out a bit, where we're not just processing this one feature. What is the framework actually doing that is then getting this feature of a response? And what it's doing is it's adding all of its own layers, saying that at the very beginning, it's literally reading bytes from a TCP socket. It might be decrypting them doing TLS. It could then be decoding some HTTP protocol, either one or two or whatnot. And then once it finally has the result, it's gonna do the opposite of all that. It's gonna actually encode it in HTTP, encrypt some bytes, and then write it back out to the TCP socket. And so all of this is kind of uh, one connected client. And it turns out this ends up being a very nice unit of isolation, kind of unit of concurrency, unit to talk about. And so we ended up giving this a name called task, where a task in this case is one connected TCP client and one, connect, one client that kind of is a unit of concurrency that enca encapsulates everything that's happening here. And then we can zoom out even further and show that a server is made up of many, many tasks. So every connected client on a server is going to be one independent task, but each of these tasks are going to be independent from one another, and each of these tasks are going to kind of, kind of run within their own unit of concurrency, but kind of interoperate with everyone else, but kind of be a, a boundary for channels of communication, for features being spawned. It's kind of no one task has features that necessarily are related to other tasks. And this is kind of just a canonical architecture that we've seen in many asynchronous servers. And so if we took a look at this, what we can actually do is try and kind of model a f set of features in a kind of a runtime system around this. So specifically, we have that a task is composed of many, many features, which are they themselves composed of many, many other features internally. But everything about those features, they have no need to cross this task. They're typically always bound to this one client, this one TCP socket. So every single one of these features can be concretely named or connected to this one task for its entire lifetime. Now, while that task is alive, it might have many features which are active. So sometimes it's waiting on the database, sometimes it's waiting on the API requests, but all those features end up being connected to, to the same task. And this task as a kind of very nice unit of concurrency and ends up being very similar to a green threaded system. Especially if you combine this with async and await, you'll notice that you actually have uh, very synchronous looking code and then you end up calling, calling spawn to spawn new tasks and it actually looks very similar to a green threading like system but it kind of has all the extra power that you get with features and with the ability to, to, oper to operate in, in, in a asynchronous fashion. So given all that, kind of the cons this kind of, we might have this idea of tasks in here and we have this kind of concrete idea of tasks following features around and features are always following a task. Let's try and redefine our trait. So right now we still only have a tree, we have a type item. And the next thing we can think of is, so earlier we were saying, uh, when are you done? Please do this when this is done. And now we can say, well, uh, let's, let's take the are we there yet approach. We'll say, are you done yet? And then are, if you are, you're gonna give me a value, and if you're not, you're not gonna give me a value. So this is kind of the next uh, road that we ended up going down, trying to actually implement features. And we say, all right, well, so this is still a trait, so we're gonna solve that problem of trait, and like having a trait and having the most specialized implementation. And the good thing is that this signature is object safe. And this, this signature automatically does allow virtual dispatch. And I won't go into the details as to why, but it suffice to say that no generics here, no by value self, it's just, it, it will be compatible with trade objects and type erasure. And so what we're gonna say here is that uh, you're gonna ask a feature periodically, are you ready yet? It's gonna return none, saying, nope, I'm not ready yet. You're gonna have to come back at a later time. Or it'll return some, saying, yep, I'm done, here's the value. And then the only problem here is saying, well, okay, if you're not ready yet, how do I actually come back to this? And you'll notice this is very similar to the asynchronous I.O. we saw at the very beginning of what the kernel is doing, where you try and read some bytes and the kernel immediately says, nope, I'm not done. And, you, and then you have to figure out when to come back and try and read those bytes again. And so we've seen earlier that features are owned by one task. So the, the entire lifetime of a future is going to be owned by a particular task and it knows what to notify. And so the task is the one that has to come back and actually know to pull this feature. So when we see none, 
what we need to do is make sure that the task is notified to come repull this feature and look at the feature again. And concretely, that means that there's an implicit protocol happening here saying that if you see none, then implicitly and automatically, your ambient task is scheduled to receive a notification that you are then ready and able to make more forward progress. So that's kind of a lot of words. So I want to kind of dive into a bit of a detail and let's kind of implement a simple timeout. This is just a, a feature that will uh, resolve at some point in the future or at some point later in time. And so the first thing we'll fill out some struct fields. We have our moments, which we're actually going to fire at. So this is just kind of uh, when our future will become resolved. And then we have some auxiliary library data structures. So we have a timer here, which has this one function, which allows us to run a closure at some particular point in time. Now, the de implementation details are not too, too important. This is mostly just how we're going to implement our future. So we'll start off by saying impl future for timeout. Our associated type is just going to be a unit, because we're not actually going to have any values here. When the future's done, it's going to say, I'm done. That's pretty much it. And then we have our pull function. So the first thing we're going to do in our pull function is say, all right, well, if, if the timeout has elapsed, then we are done. We are, can now return some, and we can now return this back out, because the time has passed for this actual future to be resolved. You have correctly pulled me at the right time. But the more interesting part is this none case. And the real thing to note here is these calls to task current and these calls to task notify. So what's happening here is that when we're not ready, we're going to return none. And our implicit protocol means that we need to notify our task when we otherwise would be done. So the definition for when this feature is going to be ready is at this point in time, we're now ready. And so we're using this auxiliary function on our timer, kind of inside of our struct, to schedule a callback to be invoked at some point, or this callback is then going to actually just notify the task. So here, this task current is built into the features crate. This is kind of a, a paradigm brought forth in features, how you actually build features. You'll pull that out. And then when you're ready, you'll call dot notify. And that'll then queue up that task to come around and pull this feature again and realize that it actually has been resolved and it's able to make forward and it's able to make further progress. So right, let's uh, take a look at this design and kind of how it matches up with the constraints that we've had so far. So first up, we have our constraints of a trait and virtual dispatch. And as I was saying, this pull-based solution, it does it obviously is a trait. And then it suffices to say that it does work, work with virtual dispatch, and we are going to allow trade objects from this. So the next aspect is we wanted to make sure that these state transitions were cheap. These, uh, all these state transitions were no, no allocations internally. It's all just happening in a very, very lightweight manner. And so if we take a look at how the tasks are actually implemented, then it turns out that when you spawn a feature, when you create a task, when you can create this giant tree, that's one allocation. You're probably going to have to have some sort of arc, some sort of piece of chunk of memory to allocate for that one particular task. But then acquiring a reference to the current task, you don't have to create a new one. You're just referencing the ambient task that you're always part of. And so acquiring the current task tends to just be an, a reference count. It's going to bump a reference count, atomic increment, all that good stuff. And then notification as well, there's no extra allocations needed there. All we're going to do is put ourselves into some form of a readiness queue. So our task is just going to be put back into some queue that already has a node allocated for it. And we can say, this is ready to go. So eventually, it'll get processed and, and, and come, come, come back to that. So this is constrained about cheap. We can say we've solved that as well. This aspect of tasks, I can dive more into the, uh, in, into the details later today. But it suffices to say that there are no allocations here while these features are executing. These two fundamental functions, current and notify, are basically just reference counts and, and queuing operations. Now, the final thing that we needed was we wanted to make sure that these features were thread safe, or kind of not necessarily thread safe, but compatible with different modes of working with threads. And so it turns out that this fundamental primitive, this task, is indeed sendable. You can send this across threads. You can use this uh, across many threads concurrently. And this ends up being a critical feature, saying that this task, not the feature itself, as it's disconnected from the future, is able to be sent across many threads. And this means that the future trait, which didn't mention callbacks, didn't mention closures, didn't mention send or sync, allows you to either write a thread-safe feature or a non-thread-safe feature in kind of whatever way you see fit. So it ends up allow it allows you to kind of bring on the cost of synchronization if you need it, or shed them if you don't need it. So it ends up we do end up solving this thread safe constraint, where we end up having this seamless interoperation, like in normal Rust, between thread safe code and non thread safe code. Where if you use a non thread safe feature across threads, then the compiler will give you an error saying you can't do that. Whereas otherwise, you can end up using uh, channels like you do today, and it'll, it'll all just nice and compile. 
But all right, so that's a little bit about the task model of futures and kind of how we end up empowering these very, very cheap state transitions and end up actually solving the constraints of working in many different environments, especially related to threads. I want to talk now about Tokyo and its relation to tasks and how we actually work with the futures there. And so in Tokyo, it uh, is critical to understand that literally everything is a future, the entire way up and down that stack. I was showing you this diagram of a task where every single unit, like even uh, decrypting SSL, reading bytes, writing bytes, all of that was built around this task model and all this futures model. So you're, you're seeing a uniform model of futures all the way up and down for these entire IO stacks the, for, from, from the top to the bottom. But it means that every single, along the way, all of these constructed features internally will eventually wait for some IO. They might need to wait for some bytes to become re readable, wait for some bytes to become writable. And so Tokyo's job is to take these events that we're receiving from the kernel and then route them to the actual tasks that are waiting on them. So we have a task that is going to be waiting to read some bytes, and we need to know when to actually wake up and notify that task to move forward. So before, this was the asynchronous I.O. interface. We, got, uh, we were trying to read some bytes, and we're going to immediately see that either here's some bytes ready to go, or this is going to be wood block. But what we're going to do here is we're going to kind of, like we did the futures, layer on an implicit protocol here, where what's happening is that all I.O. in Tokyo, like async I.O., will return immediately. None of it will ever block. But this, this notification of wood block is it implicitly saying that your task is now ready to receive a notification when you are readable. So like with a future, if you're not ready yet, you will, you will not have the value and you're scheduled to receive a notification. With I.O., if it's not ready yet, you're, not, you're gonna receive a notification when you do become readable, when you do become writable, or you're gonna finish immediately and it's going to actually be submitted to the kernel. So this allows us to build up these two extension traits called async read and async write. And you'll notice that these inherit from the standard read and write traits. But what they're doing is they're layering on these contracts. So anything that implements the async read trait is non-blocking. So it will never block the current thread. It will always return immediately. And it also has this implicit contract saying that whenever I return would block, I'm going to schedule the current future to receive a notification. And then write is very similar where write, it will receive a notification if it returns would block. And then we, add, we also add this shutdown function for graceful shutdowns, where typically this is handled via drop but in this case, we might need to block for some period of time, so this is kind of necessary for that end of things. And so these are mostly just marker traits, saying that this is an actual compatible I.O. object, but I'm gonna show you how one of these might actually be implemented. So you'll find this in the Tokyo library, of uh, this poll evented type, where this is transforming any asynchronous I.O. object into a Tokyo asynchronous I.O. object. And the first thing we'll notice here is this poll read. And so this is kind of a convention in Tokyo where any function prefixed by poll is interacting with the task system. So if this object we know for a fact is not readable, we're immediately going to return wood block without doing any I.O. And we're going to, this implicitly internally will schedule our task to be notified. So we know that because we are returning wood block, we know that our task is already scheduled to be notified. So we don't actually need to do anything else. We can just kind of continue to return wood block and move out from there. But if our object actually says that it is ready, we're going to perform the read operation and then take a look at the result that happens afterwards. So if the result from the actual I operation that we submitted to the kernel says would block, then now it's our responsibility. We have done no interaction with the task system yet, so we have to make sure we block our task. And so this function called need read is a function on the poll evented type itself, and it's going to say schedule a notification when this object is readable for the current task. And so you might be able to start seeing this where this poll evented object knows the TCP socket that it has internally. And then so we, now we know the task that we're connecting with and we know we need it to be readable. So you can kind of see now how when the kernel says that file descriptor 5 is ready for reading, Tokyo has all everything it needs to connect that up and say, oh, now that task needs to go wake up. So we're actually translating these kind of very obscure events coming from the kernel to precisely this future that task, they can now explicitly make progress and start, and start working on this object. So the event loop uh, is the one that's actually responsible for blocking the current thread. It's the one that's dispatching all these events that we receive from the kernel. It's kind of the one sitting there and looping, and we can, we can kind of see how, with all this information, we now know precisely where to actually dispatch these events. We know precisely what features to wake up, and you no longer have to worry about correctly routing notifications, correctly making sure the system is actually making progress. And so effectively, Tokyo is now translating these I.O. notifications into actually task notifications and ended up helping futures to progress forward. 
And so, all right, that was a, a bit of a whirlwind tour of features themselves, Tokyo at the lower layers, and kind of a bit of an idea of how Tokyo is, is, ends up being so fast by reducing these costs from these classical callback-based systems. So I think I have a couple minutes for questions. And so this, these are the links for uh, Tokyo itself, the project on GitHub, and the features crate itself. And you can also, also go those in. I think I'll be in the, um, the networking room today if you have any to deep Tokyo questions with Andrew back there. So uh, f f f feel free to drop by. And otherwise, thank you for, thank you for here. Thank you, Alex. I saw a hand go up over there. Push the button. Do I have to hold it? Nope. Um, so with async read and async write specifically, um, those inherit from the standard read and write traits. Um, if you have a case where you have a read implementation that assumes that you're in the context of an executing task, so if you actually call read on that outside of a task, you're going to panic. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Right, so this is where it is the having a current task is something that is currently thread local in the futures crate, and if you do not have a current task, then you otherwise try to, try to acquire it. So if we... Uh, let me see if I can go back and find that. Yes, so if you call task current and you're not actually inside of the context of a task, then that will panic. And so that means that these, uh, these operations, like this, this bare read trait, this bare implementation will indeed panic. And so currently, it's mostly set up where that ends up happening very rarely. Most of the time, these are very, especially IO is embedded very, very deep inside of features. But otherwise, a panic is a run to, like an actual programmer error and ends up showing up very, very quickly. So this is something that we've kind of struggled with in the past to make sure to kind of uh, make sure that there is a very clear demarcation. But the benefit of reusing the standard read and write traits, kind of reusing everything that currently exists, it ends up being uh, much greater than kind of what we would have gotten, well, what we would otherwise get from a static distinction of this is a, a only Tokyo readable trait and this is the standard readable trait. And an example there is a lot of the compression crates, so like the uh, flate, gzip compression, doing that in a streaming fashion, there was already a crate for that. It already worked with, with standard IO, or standard read and standard write, and it also already worked with non-blocking objects. So plugging in Tokyo was, ended, was just actually just adding the marker trait async read, and then it was basically done from there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hi, I wanted to ask, um, what's the roadmap for async I.O. with file systems rather than network sockets? It's an excellent question, and the answer is there's no roadmap. <laughs> the, uh, dealing with asynchronous file systems ends up being very difficult, where it's like kind of asynchronous on Windows, but apparently not really. I, I don't know a lot about the details there, but I think that's definitely on uh, Unix, there's basically no portable interface for asynchronous I.O. So right now, for file system operations, you tend to just have to f uh, fork it out to the thread pool. You have some thread pool actually performing blocking operations, and then you have some sort of future of doing that result. And so in, w with futures, it ends up being very ergonomic and very easy to spawn futures on thread pools and then continue to work with them. And you're just using question marks syntax the whole time with, I with IO errors and, and those kinds of objects. So it, it ends up just being that because it's ergonomic enough to kind of spin that up and spawn off that work and just get the results back out in an asynchronous fashion, that it's the thread pool is the way to go right now. And I don't think there's much. If, if the kernel gives us the ability to do better, we do better. But for now, we don't have much, we don't, we don't have much of an option. We have a lot of questions on the right hand side. So people on the left, try to think of some questions to make me walk a bit. Do you have an embedded story or an OSTD story? Uh, yes, actually. So the Tokyo crate doesn't really work with embedded because it kind of assumes Linux, OS X, Windows kind of stuff. But Futures, on the other hand, actually is compatible with embedded systems in the sense that there is a no stood version of the Futures crate. And it actually still gives you, I believe so, yeah, it gives you the task model, it gives you the task kind of, uh, task current, task notify, everything there is built. Like, you do strip out some features, features there are, like, you can't have a buffered stream, you can't have the, uh, a couple of allocating combinators, but the bare bones, the future trait, it's all compatible with that system. And the way that that works is that, uh, essentially, I was saying earlier that when you first create a task, you have to allocate an arc. 
and we basically add a trait for that, saying it's, it's an unsafe version of this trait where it's some allocated pointer that we, we, you tell us how to reference count it, how to drop it, and then we end, like, you end up doing all that. And so you can, like, what you end up can do is you can construct a system where everything is statically allocated and there literally are no runtime allocations and it, it ends, ends up just working with features. We haven't actually seen features used in the embedded context yet, but it's, it, essentially we, we, want, we always wanted to have it empowered to work at that layer. Cool, thanks. We're almost at the center. <laughs> uh, so my question is, um, uh, as, I, as I see in your timer example, you use uh, current task context to reschedule it. Uh, then if a task is uh, the, I assume, the single entry control point, why not pass it to poll function explicitly? Otherwise, it seems like uh, uh, non-trivial implicit dependency. Like if you want to reschedule, you need to know that there is such thing as task in some module and to do the stuff there. It's true. So uh, the, the question is mostly why don't we pass tasks explicitly? Why, why, why is this a thread local variable? Uh, mostly yes. All right. So uh, that's a very good question and we definitely get that a lot. So uh, the decision here was that, so on one hand, Every single poll function, every single, every single function in features is sort of parametric over a task. So we could have the entire system pass, ta pass tasks everywhere, but on one hand, that is a little, a little unergonomic but, uh, to actually end up dealing with that. But one more critical aspect ends up coming back to this IO object, where we actually we want this interop interoperation with the existing IO ecosystem, kind of everything that already is compatible with async IO should still be compatible with, with uh, Tokyo itself. And so this read trait, we're not actually defining the signature, but there's no way to pass in a task here. And there's no way to pass in a task to the actual, like you can't bind the task to the pole evented object because you're creating features before they're bound to tasks. And so the feature itself creates the pole evented before there's even a task in existence. So this is an, ex as an example actually, which is not actually possible to implement in that kind of fashion where this is going to require some sort of thread local state passing going on there. And so this is kind of one major motivating example, but kind of the other aspect, which is it's already everywhere. It's already on every single function call. And so it ends up just being a design decision where it's, it's more ergonomic. It's already happening regardless. It doesn't have any runtime impact as far as we can tell. And so it ends, and ends up making implementations uh, cleaner, more ergonomic in, in, in a sense, and also enables this sort of reusing the IO traits, reusing that existing ecosystem, and being, still being able to pass a task down in there. Uh, and so, as I understand, uh, I think timer might require task to reschedule, and like I/O socket might require something else to reschedule, and that's also the case, right? We could do that. It's kind of, it's kind of six to one half dozen or the other at that point, where you you could have two systems for doing it, but then you got to learn two systems. It is a little cleaner, and it, it's. I think it, a, lot of it, a lot of this does boil down to in that there is, we, we have not found a technical reason to pass tasks around. And so the current system we feel is kind of better for writing features, better for using features, and better with interoperating. And in the presence of a lack of a technical argument, we tend to just, st we, we, we've decided to, to stay the course with where we currently are. Okay, now for one question on the left side, anyone? <laughs> No more questions? Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, so um, I mostly played with the Tokyo I.O. level, and I was wondering if there is a way at the lower levels that's not exposed by Tokyo I.O. to prevent uh, getting uh, poles um, when there's not enough bytes in the buffer maybe. So for example, I'm reading messages and I know I need at most at least 30 bytes. Can I prevent those contact switches for the first 29 bytes? Or is it not sensible to prevent that? And by contact switches you mean like you, you pull out the current task and then you schedule yourself to get weighted because you only got one byte at a time and you're kind of coming back? No, right now there's, there's no way to do that. It's, it's one of those where 
most of the time, if you end up having a blocking operation where you're not able to resolve it at that point in time, you're already very much on the slow path. So the, the fast path is where you don't even touch the task system. You're just ready and you just keep going. And the slow path is where, all right, I'm already going to wait for multiple milliseconds to wait for these bytes to actually come in. And so by that point, it, it, there, there is no way to, to actually, I mean, you could busy wait. You could sit there in the future and spin for five milliseconds waiting for the value to come available. You're not quite as async at that point but it's kind of might be async enough for that, for that particular use case. But in general, there's no way to avoid that. You'll have to, you are forced to then get the task, put it somewhere, and then go through the whole machinery of uh, load balancing and whatnot. But there's no way to ask the kernel to say only uh, signal the event on the file descriptor if you have. No, unfortunately. At least not as far as, as, far as I know, not, not, not that I know of. Okay, thanks Alex. Thank you.